I wanted to, to I, I didn't catch it, I can't pause this thing, but when the second guy looked into the mikvah, did you catch what he said? He says, it's still alive. Now that is uh, very important because that's what the Jews would look for in the ritual bath. When they say it's alive, they mean it's moving, okay? So they, the, the rule was you make a mikvah on living water. So when Jesus says, I'm the living water, everybody would get it. You're the source of our purification, not the mikvah. So really, really quite, quite important. Okay, so our time is going, so we'll move on to Nazareth real quick. Uh, Nazareth today is a modern city. That's basically where we're, we, it's located. We were a moment ago right here on the sea. Now we're going westward uh, into uh, the western area, Nazareth. Here is Nazareth today. Uh, it's a big town. Um, uh, it's one of the largest cities uh, in uh, Israel, and it is a it is one of the largest um, Gentile cities. Uh, there's a large Arabic Christian community in Nazareth. This is the Church of the Annunciation, which is kind of the big draw in terms of uh, Nazareth, the Annunciation of the birth of Jesus. I show you this because in front of the church, the Muslims have put a verse from the Quran, whoever seeks a religion other than Islam will never be accepted of him, and in the hereafter he will be one of the losers. <laughs> so thank you very much for putting that right in front of the church. It's interesting that him in lowercase and hereafter in uppercase. Yeah, yeah. Well, English is not their second their language. So anyway, so... Uh, this is, uh, there is a, a, a system of caves and catacombs underneath the Church of the Annunci Annunciation, which we don't go into, but that's, that's uh, an interesting topographical um, uh, feature of this region. <clears throat> this is a recreation. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, we're going to go this trip to what's called Nazareth, Nazareth Village. I'm not exactly sure if this... So, so um, again, uh, the, the, the issue of... Uh, let me see if I can get to the church. The issue of the church and uh, the Mary's house. You know, what you have in that location is you have... You go down levels. You have the modern basilica of the Church of the Annunciation. Underneath that, you have a 12th century crusader church in that same location. Underneath that, you have a Jewish Christian uh, church uh, from uh, earlier than that. Uh, it, was, it was still a synagogue format, so Christians were worshiping as if they were Jews uh, in that. And then underneath that, there is the remnant of the first century house. So, so again, the, the people who, you know, are looking at this and say, well, why would all these churches be built over this house in Nazareth? Now, is it absolutely for sure that Mary left graffiti saying that Mary slept here? No, there, there, there isn't that. So we always have to kind of say in these kind of situations, well, you know, okay, well, we'll leave a little question mark there. But again, when you have those kinds of layers going down to, to uh, in the same spot, you do, you do kind of pay a little bit more attention. Uh, he, he made a good point that we don't know in, from the New Testament where Mary was when the angel Gabriel appeared to her. The traditions are either the house or the spring. Uh, and neither do we are actually know where Nazareth the word comes from. Nazareth, some say, some Hebrew scholars will say that Nazareth, Nazareth is named after the Hebrew word neser, which means branch. And of course, of course, Jesus is called the branch of the root Jesse and associated with the, the Messiah in that way. But there's also another Hebrew word that is nasar, which means to guard or to watch. And it could be that that's, it's associated with that. Of course, we know later on in the New Testament, Nazareth didn't have a great reputation. And, and uh, the, the disciples say, can anything good come out of Nazareth? That kind of thing. But here's a significant moment in Jesus' life 
from Nazareth, not that particular location, but it says in Luke 4, 14, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit uh, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath day he went to the synagogue as was his custom and he stood up to read. Uh, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has appointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he, so imagine him standing uh, or uh, seated or standing by that little thing in the middle of the Magdala synagogue, you know, he unrolled the scroll on that table. And uh, it says, then he rolled the scroll up, gave it to the attendant, and sat, so he was standing and sat down, and the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Wow. So that was quite a challenge. So all that happened in, in, uh, in Nazareth, and there's a lot more that we could go into. But our time is gone for tonight. Any final questions before we, uh, I'll let you go here? I kind of have a question. I'm seeing Tim look at a, refer to a book. Is that something that would be helpful for Yes, um, we'll, in our meeting coming up uh, for the travelers, we'll refer you to uh, two traveler guides. Uh, um, maybe it's a little dark in here, but, but uh, these are excellent. Uh, one is that the, the more dated of the two is called the Christian Traveler's Guide to the Holy Land. They have a newer version now. Okay, because I have the older version. And, um, and this goes through not only um, uh, Israel, but also Egypt and, uh, and some other areas. This is Moody Publishers. And we'll leave both these over on the table if you want to take a picture or if you want to write down. Uh, this, this is a newer one. John Beck has it called the Holy Land for Christian Travelers. And both of them are excellent. So, and both of them are available on Amazon. Can we put that over on the table sure. so people can see? Uh, I'm not sure what our, our travel company will give us. They'll give us some helpful things. But these two books are not, they probably won't give us those, and they're probably worth, worth having. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, it's a little fluid. You know, she's asking, is Nazareth a two-day thing? It's kind of a little fluid. He puts that in there because, you know, you never know about traffic. You never know about crowds. You never know about, you know, how long a particular site will take us. Nazareth is usually a one-day stop. So if we, if we get it finished, we might squeeze something else in. So that's the kind of thing that the guide and I go over in the evening and say, okay, what's up for tomorrow? And, you know, look at the crowd. Are these people totally exhausted? <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe maybe not something strenuous. So we will we'll talk about that kind of thing. So, but that's more of a kind of a general outline of the flow. So you have us doing Galilee, uh, Galilee first, and then moving down to Judea, uh, doing the, the. We'll stop at the baptismal site, uh, and, and then up to Jerusalem, and then our headquarters will be in Jerusalem for the last portion of the trip. We'll be doing mostly Jerusalem, Judea, and then uh, Dead Sea and Masada. Anything else? Okay, great. Thank you very much. Pre